All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Christ the Lord became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Almighty God, our heavenly Father, we have sinned in thought and word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We pray of your mercy. Forgive us all that has passed and grant that we may serve you in newness of life. To the glory of your name, amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, look graciously, we pray, on this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, and who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to be seated for the readings. A reading from the book of Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance, beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see, and that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church.
A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. I invite those who have roles in our dramatic reading of the Passion Gospel to come forward to one of the two microphones. The congregation is invited to refer to the scripts for the gospel that were distributed as you came in. Please join on the bolded parts. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. He replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon, Peter, and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, 
I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I have said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If, if this, this man, man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, Hail King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he is claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. 
Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now, it was the day of the preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with with him! him. Away Away with him! him. Crucify him. him! Pilate asked him, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We We have have no king but but the emperor. emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. I invite the congregation to stand. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see who who will get it. it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among myselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission. 
So he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices and linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good Friday forces us to confront some deep questions about life. Firstly, how do we make sense of the suffering that we encounter in our world? And secondly, how do we make sense of some of the misfortune and tragic events in our own lives. These are the questions that confronted Rabbi Harold Kushner. Rabbi Kushner's son died of progeria at 14 years of age. Progeria is a rare genetic disorder that leads a child to age rapidly, leading to a death by late childhood or early teens. This crisis and crisis of faith led him to place ink on paper and write his best-selling book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. As a rabbi, he knew the Torah well, yet in the wake of the tragic death of his son, he needed to understand how a God who created the world and seemingly held it together day 
after day, could allow such tragedy in his life and the lives of many, many other people. Where was God when such things happened? How could we place our faith in such a God who seemingly allowed tragedy and pain into the lives of those who followed? Kushner's quest found its answer in a simple yet profound statement. Pain is part of the package deal of being alive. Pain is part of the package deal of being alive. Pain never makes sense in the moment, doesn't always teach us about life, leaves us stunned and overwhelmed, yet to be fully human, we must and we will experience the painful experiences of life. This morning's lengthy reading of the Passion Narratives from the Gospel of John was written to answer much the same questions from the early church community. Why would God allow his son to go through such humiliation, degradation, insult, and execution? Why would God allow such means to bear upon Jesus in order to fashion a community of faith out of the ashes, ashes and ruins of such an act? In John's Gospel portion this morning, there is a weaving of oral history, tales from the early church, and passages of Old Testament scripture preambled by these things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled, which all come together to show how things that they heard about Jesus, the pain he suffered on their behalf, and the pain they experienced as communities of faith were all intertwined with the purposes of God to draw humanity and creation back on its divine course that finds its completeness in God. Rather than God being a tyrant with little feelings for the ways of humanity, the writer of John's passion narrative demonstrate how God can use life, even the worst life imaginable, as a means of hope and redemption. This October I will complete 26 years as a hospital chaplain. I have viewed much tragedy as a chaplain. Each event and story has become a window into human suffering and the revealing of God's grace. A very vivid event happened years ago in the weeks leading up to Christmas. A family came to Toronto to spend the holidays with their disabled son, who had finally moved into his own home. They arrived to find him in respiratory distress and losing consciousness. He was brought to hospital and subsequently died. The joy of anticipating Christmas together was gone, and we sat in darkness together. In the midst of the darkness, I heard mom say something that was truly profound. She told her lifeless son that he had taught her what it meant to be a mother. In an instant, I was transported to the foot of the cross and saw the image of the piata with the broken and crucified Jesus laying on Mary's lap, this one statement that she uttered brought hope into a hopeless situation. Many times as I've stood in darkness, I saw God revealed in light, compassion, and hope. 
Such hope is expressed in the actions of Jesus on the cross as he places the care of his mother into the arms of the beloved disciple. It is the hope that Jesus utters to the thieves on the crosses that paradise awaits them. The experience I shared with this family in, the dis- in distress reminded me of God's presence with us even in the darkest moments of life. And also how life can flip from celebration to tragedy very quickly. Last week we began Holy Week with the hosannas and the waving of palms. Today the altar is bare. The crosses are covered in black shrouds and death hangs in the air. How can things go so wrong in just a week? How can the chance of hosannas so quickly turn to crucify him? As a chaplain, I know how quickly life can change. How unforeseen tragedy can come quickly. How meaningless suffering can be. These images of life's incongruence leap off the pages of John's passion narrative. John's gospel takes us from a collegial meal shared with Jesus' closest followers to his betrayal by a kiss. From the master being listened to to a criminal that is abandoned from a worker of great signs to one who could not take himself down from the cross. From a wounded ear restored to Jesus' side being pierced by a Roman sword. From a mother's joy who treasured God's promises to a mother's pain as her son breathes, breathes its last breath. It is a tale pieced together like a great theatrical tragedy where everyone plays his or her part. The crowds, the authorities, the followers, the women, the thieves, and the setting which moves from place to place, palace to grave. And God is seemingly silent. No, this is my child in who I am well pleased. No, this is my child. Listen to him. Rather a cry from Jesus' lips, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? It is Jesus' cry. It is at times the cry of the Christian community, and it is at times... All too many times, our cry, which brings us to the proverbial, what now? As they leave the tomb, leave Golgotha, return to their homes for the Passover, they all ponder the question for themselves, what now? Did we follow him in vain? Can we recover and piece our lives back together? And we know, having acted out the passion year after year, that as sun sets on Saturday, as the holy fire is stoked, as candles are lit and bells are rung, that our faith is alive, our life in God is intact, and we haven't journeyed alone. The betrayers will become leaders. The persecutors will become missionaries. The fire that once burned in our hearts of those who believe will burn again. The tomb will soon be empty. A familiar voice of comfort will be heard. And God's purposes of reconciliation will explode with new life. God has been there all the time. All will be well. Amen.
Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that, through the wor- that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of eternal life. Let us pray for the one holy Catholic and apostolic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for Don, our honorary associate, Lori, our deacon, and Benjamin, our priest, for Kevin, Rosilla, and Andrew, our bishops, and all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, for those about to be baptized, that the Lord will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by your spirit, the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified. Receive our supplications and prayers, which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in our vocation and ministry, we may truly and devoutly serve you. Through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them. For Charles, our King, and all the royal family. For Justin, the Prime Minister, and for the government of this country. For Doug, the Premier of this province, and the members of the legislature. For Elizabeth, the Mayor of this municipality, and those who serve with her on the council. For all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that justice and peace may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or mind, for the hungry and homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, and all who suffer persecution or prejudice, for the sick, the wounded, and the handicapped, for those in loneliness, fear, and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives, and those in mortal danger, that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, Hear the cry of those in misery and need. In their afflictions, show them your mercy. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them. For the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ. For all who have not heard the words of salvation. For all who have lost their faith for all whose sin has made them indifferent to Christ, for all who actively oppose Christ by word or deed, for all who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples, for all who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of the peoples of the earth and lover of our souls. Have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and conviction to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it 
and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have departed this life and have died in the peace of Christ, and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, providence carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection. By him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. This is the wood of the cross on which hung the Savior of the world. Come, Come let, let us worship. worship. Is it nothing to you, all who pass by? Look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow which was brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted, inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. O oh, my church, what have I done to you, or in what have I offended you? Testify against me. I led you forth from the land of Egypt and delivered you by the waters of baptism, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. I led you through the desert forty years, and fed you with manna. I brought you through tribulation and penitence, and gave you my body, the bread of heaven. But you have prepared a cross for your Savior. What more could I have done for you that I have not done? I planted you, my chosen and fairest vineyard. I made you the branches of my vine. But when I was thirsty, you gave me vinegar to drink and pierced with a spear the side of your Savior. I went before you in a pillar of cloud, and you have led me to the judgment hall of Pilate. I scourged your enemies and brought you to a land of freedom, but you have scourged, mocked, and beaten me. I gave you the water of salvation from the rock, but you have given me gall and left me to thirst.
I gave you a royal scepter and bestowed the keys to the kingdom, but you have given me a crown of thorns. I raised you on high with great power, but you have hanged me on a, the cross. My peace I gave, which the world cannot give, and washed your feet as a sign of my love. But you draw the sword to strike in my name and seek high places in my kingdom. I offered you my body and blood, but you scatter and deny and abandon me. I sent the spirit of truth to guide you, and you close your hearts to the counselor. I pray that all may be as one in the Father and me, but you continue to quarrel and divide. I call you to go and bring forth fruit, but you cast lots for my clothing. I grafted you into the tree of my chosen Israel, and you turned on them with persecution and mass murder. I made you jo join heirs with them of my covenants, but you made them scapegoats for your own guilt. I came to you as the least of your brothers and sisters. I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Send down your abundant blessing, Lord, upon your people, who have devoutly recalled the death of your Son in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection. Grant to them pardon. Bring them comfort. May their faith grow stronger and their eternal salvation be assured. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.